Section 1 of The Chorus Girl and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Benjamin Lafferty. The Chorus Girl and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. Translated by Constance Garnett. Section 1. The Chorus Girl. One day when she was younger and better looking, and when her voice was stronger, Nikolay Petrovich Kolpakov, her adorer, was sitting in the outer room in her summer villa. It was intolerably hot and stifling. Kolpakov, who had just dined and drunk a whole bottle of inferior port, felt ill-humored and out of sorts. Both were bored and waiting for the heat of the day to be over in order to go for a walk. All at once there was a sudden ring at the door. Kolpakov, who was sitting with his coat off, in his slippers, jumped up and looked inquiringly at Pasha. "'It must be the postman or one of the girls,' said the singer. Kolpakov did not mind being found by the postman or Pasha's lady friends, but by way of precaution gathered up his clothes and went into the next room, while Pasha ran to open the door. To her great surprise in the doorway stood not the postman and not a girlfriend, but an unknown woman, young and beautiful who was dressed like a lady, and from all outward signs was one. The stranger was pale and was breathing heavily as though she had been running up a steep flight of stairs. "'What is it?' asked Pasha. The lady did not at once answer. She took a step forward, slowly looked about the room, and sat down in a way that suggested that from fatigue, or perhaps illness, she could not stand. Then for a long time her pale lips quivered as she tried in vain to speak. Is my husband here? she asked at last, raising to Pasha her big eyes with their red, tear-stained lids. Husband? whispered Pasha, and was suddenly so frightened that her hands and feet turned cold. What husband? she repeated, beginning to tremble. My husband, Nikolai Petrovich Kolpakov. No, madam, I, I don't know any husband. A minute passed in silence. The stranger several times passed her handkerchief over her pale lips and held her breath to stop her inward trembling, while Pasha stood before her motionless, like a post, and looked at her with astonishment and terror. "'So you say he is not here?' the lady asked, this time speaking with a firm voice and smiling oddly. "'I... I don't know who it is you are talking about.' "'You are horrid, mean.' Vile, the stranger muttered, scanning Pasha with hatred and repulsion. Yes, yes, you are horrid. I am very, very glad that at last I can tell you so. Pasha felt that on this lady in black with the angry eyes and white slender fingers she produced the impression of something horrid and unseemly, and she felt ashamed of her chubby red cheeks, the pockmark on her nose, and the fringe under her forehead, which never could be combed back and it seemed to her that if she had been thin, and had had no powder on her face, and no fringe on her forehead, then she could have disguised the fact that she was not respectable, and she would not have felt so frightened and ashamed to stand facing this unknown, mysterious lady. "'Where is my husband?' the lady went on. "'Though I don't care whether he is here or not, but I ought to tell you that the money has been missed, and they are looking for Nikolay Petrovich.' They mean to arrest him. That's your doing. The lady got up and walked about the room in great excitement. Pasha looked at her and was so frightened that she could not understand. He'll be found and arrested today, said the lady, and she gave a sob, and in that sound could be heard her resentment and vexation. I know who has brought him to this awful position. Low, horrid creature, loathsome, mercenary, hussy. The lady's lips worked, and her nose wrinkled up with disgust. I am helpless, do you hear, you low woman? I am helpless. You are stronger than I am, but there is one to defend me and my children. God sees all. He is just. He will punish you for every tear I have shed, for all my sleepless nights. The time will come. You will think of me. Silence followed again. The lady walked about the room and wrung her hands, 
while Pasha still gazed blankly at her in amazement, not understanding and expecting something terrible. "'I know nothing about it, madam,' she said, and suddenly burst into tears. "'You are lying!' cried the lady, and her eyes flashed angrily at her. "'I know all about it. I've known you a long time. I know that for the last month he has been spending every day with you. Yes. What then? What of it? I have a great many visitors, but I don't force anyone to come. He is free to do as he likes. I tell you they have discovered that money is missing. He has embezzled money at the office for the sake of such a creature as you. For your sake he has actually committed a crime. Listen, said the lady in a resolute voice, stopping short, facing Pasha. You can have no principles. You live simply to do harm. That's your object. But one can't imagine you have fallen so low that you have no trace of human feeling left. He has a wife. Children. If he is condemned and sent into exile, we shall starve. The children and I understand that. And yet there is a chance of saving him and us from destitution and disgrace. If I take them nine hundred roubles today, they will let him alone. Only nine hundred roubles. What nine hundred roubles? Pasha asked softly. I, I don't know. I haven't taken it. I am not asking you for nine hundred roubles. You have no money, and I don't want your money. I ask you for something else. Men usually give expensive things to women like you. Only give me back the things my husband has given you. Madam, he has never made me a present of anything, Pasha wailed, beginning to understand. Where is the money? He has squandered his own and mine and other people's. What has become of it? Listen, I beg you, I was carried away by indignation and have said a lot of nasty things to you, but I apologize. You must hate me, I know, but if you are capable of sympathy, put yourself in my position. I implore you to give me back the things. <laughs> said Pasha, and she shrugged her shoulders. I would with pleasure, but God is my witness. He never made me a present of anything, believe me, on my conscience. However, you are right, though, said the singer in confusion. He did bring me two little things. Certainly I will give them back if you wish it. Pasha pulled out one of the drawers in the toilet table and took out of it a hollow gold bracelet and a thin ring with a ruby in it. Here, madam, she said, handing the visitor these articles. The lady flushed, and her face quivered. She was offended. What are you giving me, she said. I'm not asking for charity, but for what does not belong to you. What you have taken advantage of your position to squeeze out of my husband, that weak, unhappy man. On Thursday, when I saw you with my husband at the harbor, you were wearing expensive brooches and bracelets. So it's no use your playing the innocent lamb to me. I will ask you for the last time, will you give me the things or not? You are a queer one, upon my word, said Pasha, beginning to feel offended. I assure you that, except the bracelet and this little ring, I have never seen a thing from your Nikolai Petrovich. He brings me nothing but sweet cakes. Sweet cakes, laughed the stranger. At home the children have nothing to eat, and here you have sweet cakes. You absolutely refuse to restore the presents? Receiving no answer, the lady sat down and stared into space, pondering. What's to be done now? she said. If I don't get nine hundred roubles, he is ruined, and the children and I am ruined too. Shall I kill this low woman, or go down on my knees to her? The lady pressed a handkerchief to her face and broke into sobs. I beg you, Pasha heard through the stranger's sobs. You see you have plundered and ruined my husband. Save him. You have no feeling for him, but the children, the children... What have the children done? Pasha imagined little children standing in the street, crying with hunger, and she too sobbed. What can I do, madam? she said. You say that I am a low woman, and that I have ruined Nikolai Petrovich, and I assure you before God Almighty I have nothing from him whatever. There is only one girl in our course who has a rich admirer. All the rest of us live from hand to mouth on bread and kvass. 
Nikolai Petrovich is a highly educated, refined gentleman, so I have made him welcome. We are bound to make gentlemen welcome. I ask you for the things. Give me the things. I am crying. I am humiliating myself. If you like, I will go down on my knees. If you wish it. Pasha shrieked with horror and waved her hands. She felt that this pale, beautiful lady who expressed herself so grandly, as though she were on the stage, really might go down on her knees to her, simply from pride, from grandeur, to exalt herself and humiliate the chorus girl. Very well. I will give you things, said Pasha, wiping her eyes and bustling about. By all means, only they are not from Nikolai Petrovich. I got these from other gentlemen. As you please. Pasha pulled out the upper drawer of the chest, took out a diamond brooch, a coral necklace, some rings and bracelets, and gave them all to the lady. Take them if you like, only I've never had anything from your husband. Take them and grow rich. Pasha went on, offended at the threat to go down on her knees. And if you are a lady, his lawful wife, you should keep him to yourself. I should think so. I did not ask him to come. He came of himself. Through her tears, the lady scrutinized the articles given her and said, This isn't everything. There won't be five hundred roubles worth here. Pasha impulsively flung out of the chest a gold watch, a cigar case, and studs, and said, flinging up her hands, I've nothing left. You can search. The visitor gave a sigh, with trembling hands twisted the things up in her handkerchief and went out without uttering a word, without even nodding her head. The door from the next room opened, and Kolpakov walked in. He was pale, and kept shaking his head nervously, as though he had swallowed something very bitter. Tears were glistening in his eyes. "'What presents did you make me?' Pasha asked, pouncing upon him. "'When did you allow me to ask you?' "'Presents. "'That's no matter.' said Kolpakov, and he tossed his head. My God! She cried before you. She humbled herself. I'm asking you, what presents did you make me? Pasha cried. My God! She, a lady, so proud, so pure, she was ready to go down on her knees to... to this wench! And I've brought her to this. I've allowed it! He clutched his head in his hands and moaned. No, I shall never forgive myself for this. I shall never forgive myself. Get away from me, you low creature, he cried with repulsion, backing away from Pasha and thrusting her off with trembling hands. She would have gone down on her knees and, and to you. Oh, my God! He rapidly dressed and, pushing Pasha aside contemptuously, made for the door and went out. Pasha lay down and began wailing aloud. She was already regretting her things which she had given away so impulsively, and her feelings were hurt. She remembered how three years ago a merchant had beaten her for no sort of reason, and she wailed more loudly than ever. End of Section 1 The Chorus Girl Recording by Benjamin Lafferty Section 2 of The Chorus Girl and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Benjamin Lafferty The Chorus Girl and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov Translated by Constance Garnett Section 2. Vorachka Ivan Alexeyevich Ognev remembers how on that August evening he opened the glass door with a rattle and went out onto the veranda. He was wearing a light Inverness cape and a wide-brimmed straw hat, the very one that was lying with his top boots in the dust under his bed. In one hand he had a big bundle of books and notebooks, and the other a thick knotted stick. Behind the door, holding the lamp to show the way, stood the master of the house, Kuznetsov, a bald old man with a long gray beard and a snow-white peaked jacket. The old man was smiling cordially and nodding his head. Goodbye, old fellow, said Ognev. 
Kuznetsov put the lamp on the little table and went out onto the veranda. Two long, narrow shadows moved down the steps toward the flower beds, swayed to and fro, and leaned their heads on the trunks of the lime trees. Goodbye, and once more thank you, my dear fellow, said Ivan Alexeyevich. Thank you for your welcome, for your kindness, for your affection. I shall never forget your hospitality as long as I live. You are so good, and your daughter is so good, and everyone here is so kind, so good-humored and friendly. Such a splendid set of people that I don't know how to say what I feel. From excess of feeling, and under the influence of the homemade wine he had just drunk, Ognev talked in a singing voice, like a divinity student, and was so touched that he expressed his feelings not so much by words as by the blinking of his eyes and the twitching of his shoulders. Kuznetsov had also drunk a good deal, and was touched, craned forward to the young man and kissed him. "'I've grown as fond of you as if I were a dog,' Ognev went on. "'I've been turning up here almost every day. I've stayed the night a dozen times. It's dreadful to think of all the homemade wine I've drunk. Without you, I should have been busy here over my statistics till October. I shall put in my preface. I think it my duty to express my gratitude to the president of the district Zemstvo of N. Kuznetsov for his kind cooperation. There is a brilliant future before statistics. My humble respects to Vera Gavrilovna and tell the doctors, both the lawyers and your secretary, that I shall never forget their help. And now, old fellow, let us embrace one another and kiss for the last time. Ognev, limp with emotion, kissed the old man once more and began going down the steps. On the last step he looked round and asked, Shall we meet again some day? God knows, said the old man. Most likely not. Yes, that's true. Nothing will tempt you to Petersburg, and I am never likely to turn up in this district again. Well, goodbye. You had better leave the books behind, Kuznetsov called after him. You don't want to drag such a weight with you. I would send them by a servant tomorrow. But Ognev was rapidly walking away from the house and was not listening. His heart, warmed by the wine, was brimming over with good humor, friendliness, and sadness. He walked along thinking how frequently one met with good people. And what a pity it was that nothing was left of those meetings but memories. At times... One catches a glimpse of cranes on the horizon, and a faint gust of wind brings their plaintive, ecstatic cry. And a minute later, however greedily one scans the blue distance, one cannot see a speck nor catch a sound. And like that, people with their faces and their words flit through our lives and are drowned in the past, leaving nothing except faint traces in the memory. Having been in the end district from the early spring, and having been almost every day at the friendly Kuznetsovs, Ivan Alexeyevich had become as much at home with the old man, his daughter, and the servants as though they were his own people. He had grown familiar with the whole house to the smallest detail, with the cozy veranda, the windings of the avenues, the silhouettes of the trees over the kitchen and the bathhouse. But as soon as he was out of the gate, all this would be changed to memory, and would lose its meaning as reality forever and in a year or two all these dear images would grow as dim in his consciousness as stories he had read or things he had imagined. Nothing in life is so precious as people, Ognev thought in his emotion as he strode along the avenue to the gate. Nothing. It was warm and still in the garden. There was a scent of the mignonette, of the tobacco plants, and of the heliotrope, which were not yet over in the flower beds. The spaces between the bushes and the tree trunks were filled with the fine, soft mist soaked through and through with moonlight, and, as Ognev long remembered, coils of mist that looked like phantoms, slowly but perceptibly, followed one another across the avenue. The moon stood high above the garden, and below it transparent patches of mist were floating eastward. The whole world seemed to consist of nothing but black silhouettes and wandering white shadows. Ognev! Seeing the mist on a moonlight August evening almost for the first time in his life, imagined he was seeing not nature, but a stage effect in which unskillful workmen, trying to light up the garden with white bangle fire, hid behind the bushes and let off clouds of white smoke together with the light. When Ognev reached the garden gate, a dark shadow moved away from the low fence and came towards him. Vera Gavrilovna, he said, delighted. 
You here? And I have been looking everywhere for you. Wanted to say goodbye. Goodbye. I am going away. So early? Why, it's only eleven o'clock. Yes, it's time I was off. I have a four-mile walk and then my packing. I must be up early tomorrow. Before Ognev stood Kuznetsov's daughter, Vera, a girl of one and twenty, as usual melancholy, carelessly dressed, and attractive. Girls who are dreamy and spend whole days lying down, lazily reading whatever they come across, who are bored and melancholy, are usually careless in their dress. To those of them who have been endowed by nature with taste and an instinct of beauty, the slight carelessness adds a special charm. When Ognev later on remembered her, he could not picture pretty Vorotchka, except in a full blouse which was crumpled in deep folds at the belt, and yet did not touch her waist. Without her hair done up high, and a curl that had come loose from it on her forehead, without the knitted red shawl with ball fringe at the edge, which hung disconsolately on Vera's shoulders in the evenings, like a flag on the windless day, and in the daytime lay about, crushed up, in the hall near the men's hats or on a box in the dining room, where the old cat did not hesitate to sleep on it. This shawl and the folds of her blouse suggested a feeling of freedom and laziness, of good nature and sitting at home. Perhaps because Vera attracted Ognev, he saw in every frill and button something warm, naive, cozy, something nice and poetical, just what is lacking in cold, insincere women that have no instinct for beauty. Vorotchka had a good figure, a regular profile, and beautiful curly hair. Ognev, who had seen few women in his life, thought her a beauty. "'I am going away,' he said, as he took leave of her at the gate. "'Don't remember evil against me. Thank you for everything.' In the same singing divinity student's voice in which he had talked to her father, with the same blinking and twitching of his shoulders, he began thanking Vera for her hospitality, kindness, and friendliness. "'I've written about you in every letter to my mother,' he said. "'If everyone were like you and your dad, what a jolly place the world would be. You were such a splendid set of people, all such genuine, friendly people with no nonsense about you.' "'Where are you going to now?' asked Vera. "'I am going now to my mother's at Oriel. "'I shall be a fortnight with her, and then back to Petersburg and work.' "'And then?' "'And then I shall work all winter, and in the spring go somewhere into the provinces again to collect material. "'Well, be happy. Live a hundred years. Don't remember evil against me. "'We shall not see each other again.' Ognev stooped down and kissed Vera's hand. Then, in silent emotion, he straightened his cape, shifted his bundle of books to a more comfortable position, paused, and said, What a lot of mist! Yes. Have you left anything behind? No, I don't think so. For some seconds Ognev stood in silence. Then he moved clumsily toward the gate and went out of the garden. Stay. I'll see you as far as our wood said Vera, following him out. They walked along the road. Now the trees did not obscure the view, and one could see the sky in the distance. As though covered with a veil, all nature was hidden in a transparent, colorless haze through which her beauty peeped gaily. Where the mist was thicker and whiter, it lay heaped unevenly about the stones, stalks, and bushes, or drifted in coils over the road, clung close to the earth, and seemed trying not to conceal the view. Through the haze they could see all the road as far as the wood, with dark ditches at the sides and tiny bushes which grew in the ditches and caught the straying wisps of mist. Half a mile from the gate they saw the dark patch of Kuznetsov's wood. Why has she come with me? I shall have to see her back, thought Ognev. But looking at her profile he gave a friendly smile and said, One doesn't want to go away in such lovely weather. It's quite a romantic evening with the moon the stillness, and all the etceteras. Do you know, Vera Gavrilovna, here I have lived twenty-nine years in the world, and never had a romance, no romantic episode in my whole life, so that I only know by hearsay of rendezvous, avenues of sighs and kisses. It's not normal in town when one sits in one's lodgings. One does not notice the blank. But here in the fresh air one feels it. One resents it. 
Why is it? I don't know. I suppose I've never had time, or perhaps it was I have never met a woman who— In fact, I have very few acquaintances and never go anywhere. For some three hundred paces the young people walked on in silence. Ognev kept glancing at Vorotchka's bare head and shawl, and days of spring and summer rose to his mind one after another. It had been a period when far from his grey Petersburg lodgings, enjoying the friendly warmth of kind people, nature, and the work he loved, he had not had time to notice how the sunsets followed the glow of dawn, and how, one after another, foretelling the end of the summer, first the nightingale ceased singing, then the quail, then a little later the landrail. The days slipped by unnoticed, so that life must have been happy and easy. He began calling aloud how Reluctantly he, poor and accustomed to change of scene and society, had come at the end of April to the end district, where he had expected dreariness, loneliness, and indifference to statistics, which he considered was now the foremost among the sciences. When he arrived on an April morning at the little town of N, he had put up at the inn kept by Ryabuin, the old believer, where for twenty kopecks a day they had given him a light, clean room on condition that he should not smoke indoors. After resting and finding who was the president of the district Zemstvo, he had set off at once on foot to Kuznetsov. He had to walk three miles through lush meadows and young copses. Larks were hovering in the clouds, filling the air with silvery notes, and rooks flapping their wings with sedate dignity floated over the green cornland. Good heavens, Ognev had thought in wonder, can it be that there's always air like this to breathe here, or is this scent only today? in honor of my coming. Expecting a cold, business-like reception, he went in to Kuznetsov diffidently, looking up from under his eyebrows and shyly pulling his beard. At first Kuznetsov wrinkled up his brows and could not understand what use the Zemstvo could be to the young man and his statistics, but when the latter explained at length what was material for statistics and how such material was collected, Kuznetsov brightened, smiled, and with childish curiosity began looking at his notebooks. On the evening of the same day, Ivan Alexeyevich was already sitting at supper with the Kuznetsovs, was rapidly becoming exhilarated by their strong homemade wine, and looking at the calm faces and lazy movements of his new acquaintances, felt all over that sweet, drowsy indolence which makes one want to sleep and stretch and smile. While his new acquaintances looked at him good-naturedly, and asked him whether his father and mother were living, how much he earned a month, how often he went to the theater. Ognev recalled his expeditions about the neighborhood, the picnics, the fishing parties, the visit of the whole party to the convent to see the mother superior Marfa, who had given each of the visitors a bead purse. He recalled the hot, endless, typically Russian arguments in which the opponents, spluttering and banging the table with their fists, misunderstand and interrupt one another, unconsciously contradict themselves at every phrase, continually change the subject, and after arguing for two or three hours, laugh and say, Goodness knows what we have been arguing about, beginning with one thing and going on to another. And do you remember how the doctor and you and I rode to Shestovo? said Ivan Alexeyevich to Vera as they reached the copse. It was there that the crazy saint met us. I gave him a five-kopeck piece, and he crossed himself three times and flung it into the rye. Good heavens! I am carrying away such a mass of memories that if I could gather them together into a whole it would make a good nugget of gold. I don't understand why clever, perceptive people crowd into Petersburg and Moscow and don't come here. Is there more truth and freedom in the Nevsky and in the big damp houses than here? Really, the idea of artists... Scientific men and journalists all living crowded together in furnished rooms has always seemed to me a mistake. Twenty paces from the copse the road was crossed by a small narrow bridge with posts at the corners, which had always served as a resting place for the Kuznetsovs and their guests on their evening walks. From there those who liked could mimic the forest echo, and one could see the road vanish in the dark woodland track. "'Well, here is the bridge,' said Ognev. "'Here you must turn back.' Vera stopped and drew a breath. "'Let us sit down,' she said, sitting down on one of the posts. "'People generally sit down when they say goodbye before starting on a journey.' 
Ognev settled himself beside her on his bundle of books and went on talking. She was breathless from the walk and was looking not at Ivan Alexeyitch but away into the distance so that he could not see her face. "'And what if we meet in ten years' time?' he said. "'What shall we be like, then?' "'You will be by then the respectable mother of a family, "'and I shall be the author of some weighty statistical work of no use to anyone, "'as thick as forty thousand such works. "'We shall meet and think of old days. "'Now we are conscious of the present. "'It absorbs and excites us, but when we meet we shall not remember the day, "'nor the month, nor even the year in which we saw each other for the last time on this bridge. "'You will be changed, perhaps.' Tell me, will you be different? Vera started and turned her face toward him. What? she asked. I asked you just now. Excuse me, I did not hear what you were saying. Only then Ognev noticed a change in Vera. She was pale, breathing fast, and the tremor in her breathing affected her hands and lips and head. And not one curl as usual, but two came loose and fell on her forehead. Evidently she avoided looking him in the face, and, trying to mask her emotion, at one moment fingered her collar, which seemed to be rasping her neck, at another pulled at her red shawl from one shoulder to the other. "'I'm afraid you are cold,' said Ognev. "'It's not at all wise to sit in the mist. Let me see you back, Nachhaus.' Vera sat mute. "'What is the matter?' asked Ognev with a smile. You sit silent and don't answer my questions. Are you cross, or don't you feel well? Vera pressed the palm of her hand to the cheek nearest to Ognev, and then abruptly jerked it away. An awful position, she murmured, with a look of pain on her face. Awful. How is it awful? asked Ognev, shrugging his shoulders and not concealing his surprise. What's the matter? Still breathing hard and twitching her shoulders, Vera turned back to him, looked at the sky for a half-minute, and said, "'There is something I must say to you, Ivan Alexeyitch.' "'I am listening.' "'It may seem strange to you. You will be surprised, but I don't care.' Ognev shrugged his shoulders once more and prepared himself to listen. "'You see,' Varachka began, bowing her head and fingering a ball on the fringe of her shawl, you see, this is what I wanted to tell you. You'll think it strange and silly, but I can't bear it any longer. Vera's words died away in an indistinct mutter and were suddenly cut short by tears. The girl hid her face in her handkerchief, bent lower than ever, and wept bitterly. Ivan Alexeyitch cleared his throat in confusion and looked about him hopelessly, at his wit's end, not knowing what to say or do. Being unused to the sight of tears, he felt his own eyes, too, beginning to smart. "'Well, what next?' he muttered helplessly. "'Vera Gavrilovna, what's this for? I should like to know. My dear girl, are you—are you are you ill? Or has someone been nasty to you? Tell me. Perhaps I could, so to say, help you.' When, trying to console her, he ventured cautiously to remove her hands from her face, she smiled at him through her tears and said, I love you. These words, so simple and ordinary, were uttered in an ordinary human language, but Ognev, in acute embarrassment, turned away from Vera and got up, while his confusion was followed by terror. The sad, warm, sentimental mood induced by leave-taking and the homemade wine suddenly vanished and gave place to an acute and unpleasant feeling of awkwardness. He felt an inward revulsion. He looked askance at Vera, and now that by declaring her love for him she had cast off the aloofness which so adds to a woman's charm, she seemed to him, as it were, shorter, plainer, more ordinary. What's the meaning of it? he thought with horror. But I... Do I love her or not? That's the question and she breathed easily and freely now that the words and most difficult thing was said. She too got up, and looking at Ivan Alexeyitch straight in the face, began talking rapidly, warmly, irrepressibly. As a man suddenly panic-stricken cannot 
afterwards remember the succession of sounds accompanying the catastrophe that overwhelmed him, so Ognev cannot remember Vera's words and phrases. He can only recall the meaning of what she said, and the sensation her words evoked in him. He remembers her voice, which seemed stifled and husky with emotion, and the extraordinary music and passion of her intonation. Laughing, crying with tears glistening on her eyelashes, she told him that from the first day of their acquaintance he had struck her by his originality, his intelligence, his kind, intelligent eyes, by his work and objects in his life, that she loved him passionately, deeply, madly, that when coming into the house from the garden in the summer she saw his cape in the hall or heard his voice in the distance, she felt a cold shudder at her heart, a foreboding of happiness. Even his slightest jokes had made her laugh. In every figure in his notebooks she saw something extraordinarily wise and grand. His knotted stick seemed to her more beautiful than the trees. The cops and the wisps of mist and the black ditches at the side of the road seemed hushed listening to her, whilst something strange and unpleasant was passing in Ognev's heart. Telling him of her love, Vera was enchantingly beautiful. She spoke eloquently and passionately, but he felt neither pleasure nor gladness, as he would have liked to. He felt nothing but compassion for Vera, pity and regret that a good girl should be distressed on his account. Whether he was affected by generalizations from reading, or by the insuperable habit of looking at things objectively, which so often hinders people from living, but Vera's ecstasies and suffering struck him as affected, not to be taken seriously, and at the same time rebellious feeling whispered to him that all he was hearing and seeing now from the point of view of nature and personal happiness was more important than any statistics and books and truths, and he raged and blamed himself, though he did not understand exactly where he was in fault. To complete his embarrassment, he was absolutely at a loss what to say, and yet something he must say. To say bluntly, I don't love you, was beyond him, and he could not bring himself to say, Yes, because however much he rummaged in his heart, he could not find one spark of feeling in it. He was silent. And she, meanwhile, was saying that for her there was no greater happiness than to see him, to follow him wherever he liked this very moment, to be his wife and helper, and that if he went away from her she would die of misery. I cannot stay here, she said, wringing her hands. I am sick of the house and this wood and the air. I cannot bear the everlasting peace and aimless life. I can't endure our colorless pale people, who are all as like one another as two drops of water. They are all good-natured and warm-hearted people because they are all well-fed and know nothing of struggle or suffering. I want to be in those big, damp houses where people suffer, embittered by work and need. And this, too, seemed to Ognev affected and not to be taken seriously. When Vera had finished, he still did not know what to say, but it was impossible to be silent, and he muttered, Vera Gavrilovna, I am very grateful to you though I feel I have done nothing to deserve such feeling on your part. Besides, I, as an honest man, I have to tell you that happiness depends on equality, that is, when both parties are equally in love. But he was immediately ashamed of his mutterings and ceased. He felt that his face at that moment looked stupid, guilty, blank, that it was strained and affected, Vera must have been able to read the truth on his countenance, for she suddenly became grave, turned pale, and bent her head. "'You must forgive me,' Ognev muttered, not able to endure the silence. "'I respect you so much that it, it pains me.' Vera turned sharply and walked rapidly homewards. Ognev followed her. "'No, don't,' said Vera, with a wave of her hand. "'Don't come. I can go alone.' Oh, yes, I must see you home anyway. Whatever Ognev said, it all to the last word struck him as loathsome and flat. The feeling of guilt grew greater at every step. He raged inwardly, clenched his fists, and cursed at coldness and his stupidity with women. Trying to stir his feelings, he looked at Verochka's beautiful figure, 
at her hair and the traces of her little feet on the dusty road. He remembered her words and her tears, but all that only touched his heart and did not quicken his pulse. Ach, one can't force oneself to love, he assured himself. And at the same time, he thought, But shall I ever fall in love without? I am nearly thirty. I have never met anyone better than Vera, and I never shall. Oh, this premature old age, old age at thirty. Vera walked on in front more and more rapidly, without looking back at him or raising her head. It seemed to him that sorrow had made her thinner and narrower in the shoulders. I can't imagine what's going on in her heart now, he thought, looking back at her. She must be ready to die with shame and mortification. My God, there's so much life, poetry, and meaning in it that it would move a stone, and I... I am stupid and absurd. At the gate, Vera stole a glance at him, and, shrugging and wrapping her shawl round her, walked rapidly away down the avenue. Ivan Alexeyevich was left alone. Going back to the copse, he walked slowly, continually standing still, and looking round at the gate with an expression in his whole figure that suggested that he could not believe his own memory. He looked for Vera's footprints on the road, and could not believe that the girl who had so attracted him had just declared her love, and that he had so clumsily and bluntly refused her. For the first time in his life it was his lot to learn by experience how little that a man does depends on his own will, and to suffer in his own person the feelings of a decent, kindly man who is against his will caused his neighbor cruel, undeserved anguish. His conscience tormented him, and when Vera disappeared he felt as though he had lost something very precious, something very near and dear, which he could never find again. He felt that with Vera a part of his youth had slipped away from him, and that the moments which he had passed through so fruitlessly would never be repeated. When he reached the bridge he stopped and sank into thought. He wanted to discover the reason of his strange coldness. That it was due to something within him and not outside himself was clear to him. He frankly acknowledged to himself that it was not the intellectual coldness of which clever people so often boast not the coldness of a conceited fool, but simply impotence of soul, incapacity for being moved by beauty, premature old age brought on by education, his casual existence, struggling for a livelihood, his homeless life in lodgings. From the bridge he walked slowly, as it were reluctantly, into the wood. Here, where in the dense black darkness glaring patches of moonlight gleamed here and there, where he felt nothing except his thoughts. He longed passionately to regain what he had lost. And Ivan Alexeyevich remembers that he went back again, urging himself on with his memories, forcing himself to picture Vera. He strode rapidly towards the garden. There was no mist by then along the road or in the garden, and the bright moon looked down from the sky as though it had just been washed. Only the eastern sky was dark and misty. Ognev remembers his cautious steps, the dark windows, the heavy scent of heliotrope and mignonette. His old friend Carol, wagging his tail amicably, came up to him and sniffed his hand. This was the one living creature who saw him walk two or three times round the house, stand near Vera's dark window, and with a deep sigh and a wave of his hand, walk out of the garden. An hour later he was in the town, and, worn out and exhausted, leaned his body and hot face against the gatepost of the inn as he knocked on the gate. Somewhere in the town a dog barked sleepily, and as though in response to his knock, someone clanged the hour on an iron plate near the church. "'You prowl about at night,' grumbled his host, the old believer, opening the door to him in a long nightgown like a woman's. "'You had better be saying your prayers instead of prowling about.' When Ivan Alexeyevich reached his room, he sank on the bed and gazed a long, long time at the light. Then he tossed his head and began packing. End of Section 2 Vorachka Recording by Benjamin Lafferty Section 3 of The Chorus Girl and Other Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Tavarish. The Chorus Girl and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. Translated by Constance Garnett. My Life. The Story of a Provincial. Part One. The superintendent said to me, I only keep you out of regard for your worthy father. But for that, you would have been sent flying long ago. I replied to him, You flatter me too much, Your Excellency, in assuming that I am capable of flying. And then I heard him say, Take that gentleman away, he gets upon my nerves. Two days later, I was dismissed. And in this way I have, during the years I have been regarded as grown up, lost nine situations, to the great mortification of my father, the architect of our town. I have served in various departments, but all these nine jobs have been as alike as one drop of water is to another. I had to sit, write, listen to rude or stupid observations, and go on doing so till I was dismissed. When I came in to my father, he was sitting buried in a low armchair with his eyes closed, his dry, emaciated face, with a shade of dark blue where it was shaved, he looked like an old Catholic organist, expressed meekness and resignation. Without responding to my greeting or opening his eyes, he said, If my dear wife and your mother were living, your life would have been a source of continual distress to her. I see the divine providence in her premature death. I beg you, unhappy boy, he continued, opening his eyes, tell me, what am I to do with you? In the past, when I was younger, my friends and relations had known what to do with me. Some of them used to advise me to volunteer for the army, others to get a job in a pharmacy, and others in the telegraph department. Now that I am over twenty-five, that grey hairs are beginning to show on my temples, and that I have been already in the army, and in a pharmacy, and in the telegraph department, it would seem that all earthly possibilities have been exhausted, and people have given up advising me and merely sigh or shake their heads. "'What do you think about yourself?' my father went on. "'By the time they are your age, young men have a secure social position. Well, look at you. You are a proletarian, a beggar, a burden on your father.' And, as usual, he proceeded to declare that the young people of today were on the road to perdition through infidelity, materialism and self-conceit, and that amateur theatricals ought to be prohibited because they seduced young people from religion and their duties. Tomorrow we shall go together, and you shall apologize to the superintendent and promise him to work conscientiously, he said in conclusion. You ought not to remain one single day with no regular position in society. I beg you to listen to me, I said sullenly, expecting nothing good from this conversation. What you call a position in society is the privilege of capital and education. Those who have neither wealth nor education earn their daily bread by manual labor, and I see no grounds for my being an exception. When you begin talking about manual labor, it is always stupid and vulgar said my father with irritation understand you dense fellow understand you adulpate that besides coarse physical strength you have the divine spirit a spark of the holy fire which distinguishes you in the most striking way from the ass or the reptile and brings you nearer to the deity this fire is the fruit of the efforts of the best of mankind during thousands of years. Your great-grandfather Polozniv, the general, fought at Borodino. Your grandfather was a poet, an orator, and a marshal of nobility. Your uncle is a schoolmaster, and lastly I, your father, am an architect. All the Polozniv's have guarded the sacred fire for you to put it out one must be just 
i said millions of people put up with manual labor and let them put up with it they don't know how to do anything else anybody even the most abject fool or criminal is capable of manual labor such labor is the distinguishing mark of the slave and the barbarian while the holy fire is vouchsafed only to a few to continue this conversation was unprofitable my father worshipped himself and nothing was convincing to him but what he said himself besides i knew perfectly well that the disdain with which he talked of physical toil was founded not so much on reverence for the sacred fire as on a secret dread that i should become a workman and should set the whole town talking about me what was worse all my contemporaries had long ago taken their degrees and were getting on well and the son of the manager of the state bank was already a collegiate assessor while i his only son was nothing to continue the conversation was unprofitable and unpleasant but i still sat on and feebly retorted hoping that i might at last be understood the whole question of course was clear and simple and only concerned with the means of my earning my living but the simplicity of it was not seen and i was talked to in mawkishly rounded phrases of borodino of the sacred fire of my uncle a forgotten poet who had once written poor and artificial verses i was rudely called an adulpate and a dense fellow and how i longed to be understood in spite of everything i loved my father and my sister and it had been my habit from childhood to consult them a habit so deeply rooted that i doubt whether i could ever have got rid of it whether i were in the right or the wrong i was in constant dread of wounding them constantly afraid that my father's thin neck would turn crimson and that he would have a stroke to sit in a stuffy room i began to copy to compete with a typewriter is shameful and humiliating for a man of my age what can the sacred fire have to do with it it's intellectual work anyway said my father but that's enough let us cut short this conversation and in any case i warn you if you don't go back to your work again but follow your contemptible propensities then my daughter and i will banish you from our hearts i shall strike you out of my will i swear by the living god with perfect sincerity to prove the purity of the motives by which i wanted to be guided in all my doings i said the question of inheritance does not seem very important to me i shall renounce it all beforehand for some reason or other quite to my surprise these words were deeply resented by my father he turned crimson don't dare to talk to me like that stupid he shouted in a thin shrill voice wastrel and with a rapid skilful and habitual movement he slapped me twice in the face you are forgetting yourself when my father beat me as a child i had to stand up straight with my hands held stiffly to my trouser seams and look him straight in the face and now when he hit me i was utterly overwhelmed and as though i was still a child drew myself up and tried to look him in the face my father was old and very thin but his delicate muscles must have been as strong as leather for his blows hurt a good deal i staggered back into the passage and there he snatched up his umbrella and with it hit me several times on the head and shoulders at that moment my sister opened the drawing-room door to find out what the noise was but at once turned away with a look of horror and pity without uttering a word in my defence my determination not to return to the government office but to begin a new life of toil was not to be shaken all that was left for me to do was to fix upon the special employment 
and there was no particular difficulty about that as it seemed to me that i was very strong and fitted for the very heaviest labor i was faced with a monotonous life of toil in the midst of hunger coarseness and stench continually preoccupied with earning my daily bread and who knows as i returned from my work along great dvoryansky street i might very likely envy dolzhikov the engineer who lived by intellectual work but at the moment thinking over all my future hardships made me light-hearted at times i had dreamed of spiritual activity imagining myself a teacher a doctor or a writer but these dreams remained dreams the taste of intellectual pleasures for the theatre for instance and for reading was a passion with me but whether i had any ability for intellectual work i don't know at school i had had an unconquerable aversion for greek so that i was only in the fourth class when they had to take me from school for a long while i had coaches preparing me for the fifth class then i served in various government offices spending the greater part of the day in complete idleness and i was told that was intellectual work my activity in the scholastic and official sphere had required neither mental application nor talent nor special qualifications nor creative impulse it was mechanical such intellectual work i put on a lower level than physical toil i despise it and i don't think that for one moment it could serve as a justification for an idle careless life as it is indeed nothing but a sham one of the forms of that same idleness real intellectual work i have in all probability never known evening came on we lived in great dvoryansky street it was the principal street in the town and in the absence of decent public gardens our beau monde used to use it as a promenade in the evenings the charming street did to some extent take the place of a public garden as on each side of it there was a row of poplars which smelt sweet particularly after rain and acacias tall bushes of lilac wild cherries and apple trees hung over the fences and palings the may twilight the tender young greenery with its shifting shades the scent of the lilac the buzzing of the insects the stillness the warmth how fresh and marvelous it all is though spring is repeated every year i stood at the garden gate and watched the passers-by with most of them i had grown up and at one time played pranks now they might have been disconcerted by my being near them for i was poorly and unfashionably dressed and they used to say of my very narrow trousers and huge clumsy boots that they were like sticks of macaroni stuck in boats besides i had a bad reputation in the town because i had no decent social position and used often to play billiards in cheap taverns and also perhaps because i had on occasion been hauled up before an officer of the police though i had done nothing whatever to account for this in the big house opposite someone was playing the piano at dolzhikov's it was beginning to get dark and stars were twinkling in the sky here my father in an old top hat with wide upturned brim walked slowly by with my sister on his arm bowing in response to greetings look up he said to my sister pointing to the sky with the same umbrella with which he had beaten me that afternoon look up at the sky even the tiniest stars are all worlds how insignificant is man in comparison with the universe and he said this in a tone that suggested that it was particularly agreeable and flattering to him that he was so insignificant how absolutely devoid of talent and imagination he was sad to say he was the only architect in town and in the fifteen to twenty years that i could remember not one single decent house had been built in it 
when any one asked him to plan a house he usually drew first the reception hall and drawing-room just as in old days the boarding-school missies always started from the stove when they danced so this artistic ideas could only begin and develop from the hall and drawing-room to them he tacked on a dining-room a nursery a study linking the rooms together with doors and so they all inevitably turned into passages and every one of them had two or even three unnecessary doors his imagination must have been lacking in clearness extremely muddled curtailed as though feeling that something was lacking he invariably had recourse to all sorts of outbuildings planting one beside another and i can see now the narrow entries the pokey little passages the crooked staircases leading to half landings where one could not stand upright and where instead of a floor there were three huge steps like the shelves of a bathhouse and the kitchen was invariably in the basement with a brick floor and vaulted ceilings the front of the house had a harsh stubborn expression the lines of it were stiff and timid the roof was low-pitched and as it were squashed down and the fat well-fed looking chimneys were invariably crowned by wire caps with squeaking black cowls and for some reason all these houses built by my father exactly like one another vaguely reminded me of his top hat and the back of his head stiff and stubborn looking in the course of years they have grown used in the town to the poverty of my father's imagination it has taken root and become our local style this same style my father had brought into my sister's life also beginning with christening her cleopatra just as he had named me misail when she was a little girl he scared her by references to the stars to the sages of ancient times to our ancestors and discoursed at length on the nature of life and duty and now when she was twenty-six he kept up the same habits allowing her to walk arm in arm with no one but himself and imagining for some reason that sooner or later a suitable young man would be sure to appear and to desire to enter into matrimony with her from respect for his personal qualities she adored my father feared him and believed in his exceptional intelligence it was quite dark and gradually the street grew empty the music had ceased in the house opposite the gate was thrown wide open and a team with three horses trotted frolicking along our street with a soft tinkle of little bells that was the engineer going for a drive with his daughter it was bedtime i had my own room in the house but i lived in a shed in the yard under the same roof as a brick barn which had been built some time or other probably to keep harness in great hooks were driven into the wall now it was not wanted and for the last thirty years my father had stowed away in it his newspapers which for some reason he had bound in half yearly volumes and allowed nobody to touch living there i was less liable to be seen by my father and his visitors and i fancied that if i did not live in a real room and did not go into the house every day to dinner my father's words that i was a burden upon him did not sound so offensive my sister was waiting for me unseen by my father she had brought me some supper not a very large slice of cold veal and a piece of bread in our house such saying as a penny saved is a penny gained and take care of the pence and the pounds will take care of themselves and so on were frequently repeated and my sister weighed down by these vulgar maxims did her utmost to cut down the expenses and so we fared badly putting the plate on the table she sat down on my bed and began to cry misail she said what a way to treat us 
She did not cover her face. Her tears dropped on her bosom and hands, and there was a look of distress on her face. She fell back on the pillow and abandoned herself to her tears, sobbing and quivering all over. You have left the service again, she articulated. Oh, how awful it is! But do understand, sister, do understand, I said, and I was overcome with despair because she was crying. As ill luck would have it, the kerosene in my little lamp was exhausted. It began to smoke and was on the point of going out, and the old hooks on the walls looked down sullenly, and their shadows flickered. Have mercy on us, said my sister, sitting up. Father is in terrible distress, and I am ill. I shall go out of my mind. What will become of you? She said, sobbing and stretching out her arms to me. I beg you, I implore you, for our dear mother's sake, I beg you to go back to the office. I can't, Cleopatra, I said, feeling that a little more and I should give way. I cannot. Why not? My sister went on. Why not? Well, if you can't get on with the head, look out for another post. Why shouldn't you get a situation on the railway, for instance? I have just been talking to Anuta Blagovo. She declares they would take you on the railway line and even promised to try and get a post for you. For God's sake, Misail, think a little. Think a little, I implore you. We talked a little longer, and I gave way. I said that the thought of a job on the railway that was being constructed had never occurred to me, and that if she liked, I was ready to try it. She smiled joyfully through her tears and squeezed my hand, and then went on crying because she could not stop while I went to the kitchen for some kerosene. Among the devoted supporters of amateur theatricals, concerts, and tableau vivant for charitable objects, the Azhogins, who lived in their own house in Great Dvoryansky Street, took a foremost place. They always provided the room and took upon themselves all the troublesome arrangements and the expenses. They were a family of wealthy landowners who had an estate of some 9,000 acres in the district and a capital house. But they did not care for the country and lived winter and summer alike in the town. The family consisted of the mother, a tall, spare, refined lady, with short hair, a short jacket and a flat-looking skirt in the English fashion and three daughters who, when they were spoken of, were called not by their names but simply the eldest, the middle, and the youngest. They all had ugly sharp chins, and were short-sighted and round-shouldered. They were dressed like their mother, they lisped disagreeably, and yet, in spite of that, infallibly took part in every performance and were continually doing something with a charitable object acting, reciting, singing. They were very serious and never smiled, and even in a musical comedy they played without the faintest trace of gaiety, with a business-like air, as though they were engaged in bookkeeping. I loved our theatricals, especially the numerous, noisy, and rather incoherent rehearsals, after which they always gave a supper. In the choice of the plays and the distribution of the parts I had no hand at all. The post assigned to me lay behind the scenes. I painted the scenes, copied out the parts, prompted, made up the actors' faces, and was entrusted, too, with various stage effects, such as thunder, the singing of nightingales, and so on. Since I had no proper social position and no decent clothes, at the rehearsals I held aloof from the rest in the shadows of the wings and maintained a shy silence. I painted the scenes at the Azhogins either in the barn or in the yard. I was assisted by Andrei Ivanov, a house painter, 
or as he called himself a contractor for all kinds of house decorations a tall very thin pale man of fifty with a hollow chest with sunken temples with blue rings round his eyes rather terrible to look at in fact he was afflicted with some internal malady and every autumn and spring people said that he wouldn't recover but after being laid up for a while, he would get up and say afterwards with surprise, I have escaped dying again. In the town he was called Radish, and they declared that this was his real name. He was as fond of the theatre as I was, and as soon as rumours reached him that a performance was being got up, he threw aside all his work and went to the Arjogins to paint scenes. The day after my talk with my sister, I was working at the Arjogins from morning till night. The rehearsal was fixed for seven o'clock in the evening, and an hour before it began, all the amateurs were gathered together in the hall, and the eldest, the middle, and the youngest Arjogins were pacing about the stage, reading from manuscript books. Radish, in a long rusty red overcoat and a scarf muffled round his neck, already stood leaning with his head against the wall, gazing with a devout expression at the stage. Madame Ajorgin went up first to one and then to another guest, saying something agreeable to each. She had a way of gazing into one's face and speaking softly as though telling a secret. It must be difficult to paint scenery, she said softly coming up to me. I was just talking to Madame Mufki about superstitions when I saw you come in. My goodness, my whole life I have been waging war against superstitions. To convince the servants what nonsense all their terrors are, I always light three candles and begin all my important undertakings on the thirteenth of the month. Dolzhikov's daughter came in, a plump, fair beauty, dressed, as people said, in everything from Paris. She did not act, but a chair was set for her on the stage at the rehearsals, and the performances never began till she had appeared in the front row, dazzling and astounding everyone with her fine clothes. As a product of the capital, she was allowed to make remarks during the rehearsals, and she did so with a sweet indulgent smile and one could see that she looked upon our performance as a childish amusement it was said she had studied singing at the petersburg conservatory and even sang for a whole winter in a private opera i thought her very charming and i usually watched her through the rehearsals and performances without taking my eyes off her I had just picked up the manuscript book to begin prompting when my sister suddenly made her appearance. Without taking off her cloak or hat, she came up to me and said, Come along, I beg you. I went with her. Anuta Blagovo, also in her hat and wearing a dark veil, was standing behind the scenes at the door. She was the daughter of the assistant president of the court who had held that office in our town almost ever since the establishment of the circuit court. Since she was tall and had a good figure, her assistance was considered indispensable for tableau vivant, and when she represented a fairy or something like glory, her face burned with shame. But she took no part in dramatic performances and came to the rehearsals only for a moment on some special errand, and did not go into the hall. Now, too, it was evident that she had only looked in for a minute. My father was speaking about you, she said dryly, blushing and not looking at me. Dolzhikov has promised you a post on the railway line. Apply to him tomorrow. He will be at home. I bowed and thanked her for the trouble she had taken. And you can give up this, she said indicating the exercise book. My sister and she went up to Madame Ajorgin, and for two minutes they were whispering with her looking towards me. They were consulting about something. Uh, yes, indeed, said Madame Ajorgin, softly coming up to me and looking intently into my face. Yes, indeed, 
if this distracts you from serious pursuits she took the manuscript book from my hands you can hand it over to someone else don't distress yourself my friend go home and good luck to you i said good-bye to her and went away overcome with confusion as i went down the stairs i saw my sister and anyuta blagovo going away they were hastening along uh, talking eagerly about something probably about my going into the railway service my sister had never been at a rehearsal before and now she was most likely conscience-stricken and afraid her father might find out that without his permission she had been to the ajogins i went to dolzhikov's next day between twelve and one the footman conducted me into a very beautiful room which was the engineer's drawing-room and at the same time his working study everything here was soft and elegant and for a man so unaccustomed to luxury as i was it seemed strange there were costly rugs huge armchairs bronzes pictures golden plush frames among the photographs scattered about the walls there were very beautiful women clever lovely faces easy attitudes from the drawing-room there was a door leading straight into the garden on to a veranda one could see lilac trees one could see a table laid for lunch a number of bottles a bouquet of roses there was a fragrance of spring and expensive cigars a fragrance of happiness and everything seemed as though it would say here is a man who has lived and labored and has attained at last the happiness possible on earth the engineer's daughter was sitting at the writing table reading a newspaper you have come to see my father she asked he is having a shower bath he will be here directly please sit down and wait i sat down i believe you live opposite she questioned me after a brief silence yes i am so bored that i watch every day out of the window you must excuse me she went on looking at the newspaper and i often see your sister she always has such a look of kindness and concentration dolzhikov came in he was rubbing his neck with a towel uh, papa monsieur poloznev said his daughter yes yes blagovo was telling me he turned briskly to me without giving me his hand uh, but listen what can i give you what sort of posts have i got uh, you are a queer set of people he went on aloud in a tone as though he were giving me a lecture a score of you keep coming to me every day you imagine i am the head of a department i am constructing a railway line my friends i have employed for heavy labor i need mechanics smiths navvies carpenters well sinkers and none of you can do anything but sit and write you are all clerks and he seemed to me to have the same air of happiness as his rugs and easy chairs he was stout and healthy ruddy-cheeked and broad-chested in a print cotton shirt and full trousers like a toy china sledge driver he had a curly round beard and not a single gray hair a hooked nose and clear dark guileless eyes what can you do he went on there is nothing you can do i am an engineer i am a man of an assured position but before they gave me a railway line i was for years in harness i have been a practical mechanic for two years i worked in belgium as an oiler you can judge for yourself my dear fellow what kind of work can i offer you of course that is so i muttered in extreme confusion unable to face his clear guileless eyes can you work the telegraph anyway he asked after a moment's thought yes i have been a telegraph clerk hm well we will see then meanwhile meanwhile go to dubechnia i have got a fellow there but he is a wretched creature and what will my duties consist of 
i asked we shall see go there meanwhile i will make arrangements only please don't get drunk and don't worry me with requests of any sort or i shall send you packing he turned away from me without even a nod i bowed to him and his daughter who was reading a newspaper and went away my heart felt so heavy that when my sister began asking me how the engineer had received me i could not utter a single word i got up early in the morning at sunrise to go to dubechnya there was not a soul in our great dvoryansky street everyone was asleep and my footsteps rang out with a solitary hollow sound the poplars covered with dew filled the air with soft fragrance i was sad i did not want to go away from the town i was fond of my native town it seemed to be so beautiful and so snug i loved the fresh greenery the still sunny morning the chiming of our bells but the people with whom i lived in this town were boring alien to me sometimes even repulsive i did not like them nor understand them i did not understand what these sixty-five thousand people lived for and by i knew that kimri lived by boots that tula made samovars and guns that odessa was a seaport but what our town was and what it did i did not know great dvoryansky street and the two other smartest streets lived on the interest of capital and on salaries received by officials from the public treasury but what the other eight streets which ran parallel for over two miles and vanished beyond the hills lived upon was always an insoluble riddle to me and the way those people lived one is ashamed to describe no garden no theatre no decent band the public library and the club library were only visited by jewish youths so that the magazines and new books lay for months uncut rich and well-educated people slept in close stuffy bedrooms on wooden bedsteads infested with bugs their children were kept in revoltingly dirty rooms called nurseries and the servants even the old and respected ones slept on the floor in the kitchen covered with rags on ordinary days the houses smelt of beetroot soup and on fast days of sturgeon cooked in sunflower oil the food was not good and the drinking water was unwholesome in the town council at the governors at the head priests on all sides in private houses people had been saying for years and years that our town had not a good and cheap water supply and that it was necessary to obtain a loan of two hundred thousand from the treasury for laying on water very rich people of whom three dozen could have been counted up in our town and who at times lost whole estates at cards drank their polluted water too and talked all their lives with great excitement of a loan for the water supply and i did not understand that it seemed to me it would have been simpler to take the two hundred thousand out of their own pockets and lay it out on that object i did not know the honest men in the town my father took bribes and imagined that they were given him out of respect for his moral qualities at the high school in order to be moved up rapidly from class to class the boys went to board with their teachers who charged them exorbitant sums the wife of the military commander took bribes from the recruits when they were called up before the board and even deigned to accept refreshments from them and on one occasion could not get up from her knees in church because she was drunk the doctors took bribes too when the recruits came up for examination and the town doctor and the veterinary surgeon 
levied a regular tax on the butchers' shops and the restaurants. At the district school they did a trade in certificates qualifying for partial exemption from military service. The higher clergy took bribes from the humbler priests and from the church elders. At the municipal, the artisans and all the other boards, every petitioner was pursued by a shout, Don't forget your thanks! And the petitioner would turn back to give sixpence or a shilling. And those who did not take bribes, such as the higher officials of the Department of Justice, were haughty offered two fingers instead of shaking hands, were distinguished by the frigidity and narrowness of their judgments, spent a great deal of time over cards, drank to excess, married heiresses, and undoubtedly had a pernicious corrupting influence on those around them. It was only the girls who had still the fresh fragrance of moral purity. Most of them had higher impulses, pure and honest hearts, but they had no understanding of life and believed that bribes were given out of respect for moral qualities and after they were married grew old quickly, let themselves go completely and sank hopelessly in the mire of vulgar, petty, bourgeois existence. A railway line was being constructed in our neighborhood. On the eve of feast days the streets were thronged with ragged fellows whom the townspeople called navvies, and of whom they were afraid, and more than once I had seen one of these tatterdemalions with a blood-stained countenance being led to the police station while the samovar or some linen wet from the wash was carried behind by way of material evidence. The navvies usually congregated about the taverns and the marketplace. They drank, ate, and used bad language, and pursued with shrill whistles every woman of light behavior who passed by. To entertain this hungry rabble, our shopkeepers made cats and dogs drunk with vodka, or tied an old kerosene can to a dog's tail, a hue and cry was raised, and the dog dashed along the street, jingling the can, squealing with terror. It fancied some monster was close upon its heels. It would run far out of the town into the open country, and there sink exhausted. There were in the town several dogs who went about trembling with their tails between their legs, and people said this diversion had been too much for them and had driven them mad. A station was being built four miles from the town. It was said that the engineers asked for a bribe of 50,000 rubles for bringing the line right up to the town, but the town council could only consent to give 40,000. They could not come to an agreement over the difference, and now the townspeople regretted it as they had to make a road to the station, and that, it was reckoned, would cost more. The sleepers and rails had been laid throughout the whole length of the line, and trains ran up and down it, bringing building materials and laborers, and further progress was only delayed on account of the bridges, which Dolzhikov was building, and some of the stations were not yet finished. Dubechnya, as our first station was called, was a little under twelve miles from the town. I walked. The cornfields, bathed in the morning sunshine, were bright green. It was a flat, cheerful country, and in the distance there were the distinct outlines of the station of ancient barrows and faraway homesteads. How nice it was out there in the open! And how I longed to be filled with the sense of freedom, if only for that one morning, that I might not think of what was being done in the town, not think of my needs, not feel hungry. Nothing has so marred my existence as an acute feeling of hunger, which made images of buckwheat porridge, rissoles, and baked fish mingle strangely with my best thoughts. 
here i was standing alone in the open country gazing upward at a lark which hovered in the air at the same spot trilling as though in hysterics and meanwhile i was thinking how nice it would be to eat a piece of bread and butter or i would sit down by the roadside to rest and shut my eyes to listen to the delicious sounds of may and what haunted me was the smell of hot potatoes though i was tall and strongly built i had as a rule little to eat and so the predominant sensation throughout the day was hunger and perhaps that was why i knew so well how it is that such multitudes of people toil merely for their daily bread and can talk of nothing but things to eat at dubechnya they were plastering the inside of the station and building a wooden upper story to the pumping shed it was hot there was a smell of lime, and the workmen sauntered listlessly between the heaps of shavings and mortar rubble. The pointsman lay asleep near his sentry box, and the sun was blazing full on his face. There was not a single tree. The telegraph wire hummed faintly, and hawks were perching on it here and there, I, wandering too among the heaps of rubbish and not knowing what to do, recalled how the engineer, in answer to my question what my duties would consist in, had said, We shall see when you are there. But what could one see in that wilderness? The plasters spoke of the foreman and of a certain Fyodor Vasilyev. I did not understand, and gradually I was overcome by depression the physical depression in which one is conscious of one's arms and legs and huge body and does not know what to do with them or where to put them after i had been walking about for at least a couple of hours i noticed that there were telegraph poles running off to the right from the station and that they ended a mile or a mile and a half away at a white stone wall the workman told me the office was there and at last i reflected that that was where i ought to go it was a very old manor house deserted long ago the wall round it of porous white stone was mouldering and had fallen away in places and the lodge the blank wall of which looked out on the open country had a rusty roof with patches of tin plate gleaming here and there on it within the gates could be seen a spacious courtyard overgrown with rough weeds and an old manor house with sun blinds on the windows and a high roof red with rust two lodges exactly alike stood one on each side of the house to right and to left one had its windows nailed up with boards near the other of which the windows were open there was washing on the line and there were calves moving about the last of the telegraph poles stood in the courtyard and the wire from it ran to the window of the lodge of which the blank wall looked out into the open country the door stood open i went in by the telegraph apparatus a gentleman with a curly dark head wearing a reefer coat made of sailcloth was sitting at a table he glanced at me morosely from under his brows but immediately smiled and said hello better than nothing it was ivan cheprakov an old schoolfellow of mine who had been expelled from the second class for smoking we used at one time during autumn to catch goldfinches finches and linnets together and to sell them in the market early in the morning while our parents were still in their beds we watched for flocks of migrating starlings and shot at them with small shot then we picked up those that were wounded and some of them died in our hands in terrible agonies I remember to this day how they moaned in the cage at night those that recovered we sold and swore with the utmost effrontery that they were all cocks on one occasion at the market i had only one starling left which i had offered to purchase in vain till at last i sold it for a farthing 
anyway it's better than nothing i said to comfort myself as i put the farthing in my pocket and from that day the street urchins and the schoolboys called after me better than nothing and to this day the street boys and the shopkeepers mock at me with the nickname though no one remembers how it arose Chepraков was not of robust constitution he was narrow-chested round-shouldered and long-legged he wore a silk cord for a tie and had no trace of a waistcoat and his boots were worse than mine with the heels trodden down on one side he stared hardly even blinking with a strained expression as though he were just going to catch something and he was always in a fuss you wait a minute he would say fussily you listen whatever was i talking about we got into conversation i learned that the estate on which i now was had until recently been the property of the Cheprakovs, and had only the autumn before passed into the possession of dolzhikov who considered it more profitable to put his money into land than to keep it in notes and had already bought up three good-sized mortgaged estates in our neighborhood at the sale Chepraков's mother had reserved for herself the right to live for the next two years in one of the lodges at the side and had obtained a post for her son in the office. I should think he could buy, Chebrakov said of the engineer. See what he fleeces out of the contractors alone? He fleeces everyone. Then he took me to dinner deciding fussily that I should live with him in the lodge and have my meals from his mother. She is a bit stingy, he said, but she won't charge you much. It was very cramped in the little rooms in which his mother lived. They were all, even the passage and the entry, piled up with furniture, which had been brought from the big house after the sale and the furniture was all old-fashioned mahogany. Madame Cheprakov, a very stout middle-aged lady with slanting Chinese eyes, was sitting in a big armchair by the window, knitting a stocking. She received me ceremoniously. "'This is Polozniv, mamma. Cheprakov introduced me. "'He's going to serve here.' "'Are you a nobleman?' she asked in a strange disagreeable voice it seemed to me to sound as though fat were bubbling in her throat yes i answered sit down the dinner was a poor one nothing was served but pies filled with bitter curd and milk soup elena nikiforovna who presided kept blinking in a queer way first with one eye and then with the other she talked, she ate, but yet there was something deathly about her whole figure, and one almost fancied the faint smell of a corpse. There was only a glimmer of life in her, a glimmer of consciousness that she had been a lady who had once had her own serfs, that she was the widow of a general whom the servants had to address as Your Excellency, and when these feeble relics of life flickered up in her for an instant, she would say to her son, Jean, you are not holding your knife properly. Or she would say to me, drawing a deep breath, with the mincing air of a hostess trying to entertain a visitor, you know we have sold our estate of course it is a pity we are used to the place but dolzhikov has promised to make jean station master of dubetchnya so we shall not have to go away we shall live here at the station and that is just the same as being on our own property the engineer is so nice don't you think he is very handsome until recently the Chiprakovs had lived in a wealthy style, but since the death of the general everything had been changed. Elena Nikiforovna had taken to quarrelling with the neighbours, to going to law, and to not paying her bailiffs or her labourers. She was in constant terror of being robbed, and in some ten years Dubechnya had become unrecognisable. 
Behind the great house was an old garden, which had already run wild and was overgrown with rough weeds and bushes. I walked up and down the veranda, which was still solid and beautiful. Through the glass doors one could see a room with parquetted floor, probably the drawing room, an old-fashioned piano and pictures in deep mahogany frames. There was nothing else. In the old flower beds all that remained were peonies and poppies, which lifted their white and bright red heads above the grass. Young maples and elms, already nibbled by the cows, grew beside the paths, drawn up and hindering each other's growth. Their garden was thickly overgrown and seemed impassable, but this was only near the house, where there stood poplars, fir trees, and old lime trees, all of the same age, relics of the former avenues. Further on, beyond them, the garden had been cleared for the sake of hay, and here it was not moist and stuffy, and there were no spider's webs in one's mouth and eyes. A light breeze was blowing. The further one went, the more open it was, and here in the open space were cherries, plums, and spreading apple trees, disfigured by props and by canker and pear trees so tall that one could not believe they were pear trees. This part of the garden was let to some shopkeepers of the town, and it was protected from thieves and starlings by a feeble-minded peasant who lived in a shanty in it. The garden, growing more and more open till it became definitely a meadow, sloped down to the river, which was overgrown with green weeds and osiers. Near the mill dam was the mill pond, deep and full of fish. A little mill with a thatched roof was working away with a wrathful sound, and frogs croaked furiously. Circles passed from time to time over the smooth mirror-like water, and the water lilies trembled, stirred by the lively fish. On the further side of the river was the little village Dubechnya. The still blue mill pond was alluring with its promise of coolness and peace. And now all this, the mill pond and the mill and the snug looking banks, belonged to the engineer. And so my new work began. I received and forwarded telegrams, wrote various reports, and made fair copies of the notes of requirements, the complaints, and the reports sent to the office by the illiterate foremen and workmen. But for the greater part of the day I did nothing but walk about the room waiting for telegrams, or made a boy sit in the lodge while I went for a walk in the garden until the boy ran to tell me that there was a tapping at the operating machine. I had dinner at Madame Cheprakov's. Meat we had very rarely. Our dishes were all made of milk, and Wednesdays and Fridays were fast days, and on those days we had pink plates, which were called Lenten plates. Madame Cheprakov was continually blinking. It was her invariable habit, and I always felt ill at ease in her presence. As there was not enough work in the lodge for one, Cheprakov did nothing but simply dozed, or went with his gun to shoot ducks on the mill pond. In the evenings he drank too much in the village or the station, and before going to bed stared in the looking-glass and said, Hello, Ivan Cheprakov. When he was drunk he was very pale, and kept rubbing his hands and laughing with a sound like a neigh. <laughs> by way of bravado he used to strip and run about the country naked he used to eat flies and say they were rather sour end of section three